You've got one minute before, we, before I said, I'm just going to explain this. You are not submitting your work on GitHub at all. I'm just teaching you how to properly develop coding. That's all. Uh, GitHub is showing, like doing your work on GitHub is, oh, sorry, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, working on GitHub, it means how to properly code. I'm telling you, I'm teaching you how to, how do people code in real life? They don't just open up their computer and, okay, that's how it works. So you submit it from, on Matrix, but to collaborate, you work on GitHub, okay? I had a very nice gentleman, um, actually, um, I have to point this out too, and for those who are listening to the recording, because there are like 10 people over here, and I have 30 students, so apparently the 20 are not here. So when I ask you to create a GitHub repository and add me as a collaborator, <clears throat> it's, that repository is only for you and me and no one else. You cannot add your friend as a collaborator. That's plagiarism, okay? If, and if, and you, if you want to experiment, see how push and pull and all the good stuff works, create another repository. And with that repository, add five of your friends as collaborators and test all these good stuff, okay? Um, play with it and see how push and pull, pull, pull requests and stuff works. And if it doesn't make sense to you, don't even do it, okay? But um, your uh, OP244 works repository, as I requested, is uh, the one that is for you and I only and no one else. Number, number one. Number two, uh, what I wanted to say, um, one thing that I explained at the beginning of the semester and I did not mention over here, if you were my IPC student, you already know this. Computer science and your career in computer is an exact science. Okay, when I ask you to take two steps, scratch your head, then rub your nose to the wall. That's what you exactly do. You don't misstep. You don't do one before the other. When I tell you, you have to do this, that, and the other, all three must be done exactly as I ask you to do, period. Not a comma extra, not the comma less. Many of you created the repository, but they just created it. Oh, oh read me file, I'm not gonna create it, who cares? I have the repository. Oh, I'm not gonna put, like, they just, the read me file has only OOP in it. And it doesn't say what is the, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, repository's purpose. It doesn't mention who you are. And I ask you, when you're creating your profile on GitHub, the whole idea for you is to make yourself visible on internet that you're a programmer, which means when you create your ID, you put your real name, real last name over there, real email, so you are visible. And many people that just create an ID and they don't even have their name over there. So I'm trying to guess to see who's this person so to send a message. So if you receive a message on Microsoft Teams from me saying that your GitHub repository is not precise and you have to do this and this and that, um, please follow the instructions and do it properly. Okay, let's start. So we are going to talk about uh, uh, derived classes. And to do that, to do that, I um, create something. Uh, before, before we start, I forgot, standard thing. Um, any questions? Before we begin, yes. Fast recordings? Okay, so <clears throat> every single, uh, let me open up a browser. So you go GitHub. OOP244, right? You search for that. The very first thing that comes up is the uh, organization that we have, right? When you go on that organization, this, these are the class that you're in, OOP244, NAA, NBB, and ZAA. You see that? Click over there. And then you scroll down. One, well, lecture recordings. Okay, you click on NAA. That is yours. You come over here. This is the one that we had from the last one. When you click on it, 
It opens up either the YouTube video. All right, hello again, day two. Okay. We are going to uh, All right. continue our... So, so either shows that one or for, I'm gonna add another link for you from Big Blue Button because the first recording I didn't have this monstrosity with me. Uh, I recorded it through Big Blue Button, but now using this, I just recorded and, and posted on YouTube, okay? So that's that. Is that okay? Any other question? Any material, anything that I do is going to be in here. So please um, check it. Uh, another thing that I have to do probably is this. Just a second. I'm going to pause while doing this. Okay, so to just to repeat what I wanted to, what, what I said before, when you are dealing with the repository, uh, clone is download for the first time. Pull is to download updates, new stuff every single time. Um, and these are for read only repositories. So these two things are the only two things you need to do with something like workshops, project, or the notes that I have because you don't change any of them, anything in them. And I strongly suggest that don't change anything in them. If you want to make, if you want to practice on the code that I have written, you pull mine, then you go to the directory that you want to do your, like fiddle with it and try it and see how it works. You copy that directory into your own repository. Create a uh, directory in your own repository, call it sandbox. That's a very, uh, Normal, way, normal name for programmers to indicate that this directory for me is to play in it. Sandbox kids play in it, okay? That's what they call it. So you create a directory called Sandbox. Inside that directory, copy and paste the, direct, the things you want to play with into and then start playing with it, okay? Or if you are working with your friend, create a completely separate repository for your everyday work. And you can add that add me to that one as a collaborator too. The one that you do not develop your workshops in it. And that one you can add your friends as collaborator to and study together. But the workshops repository where you develop your workshops and project must be private. If you add a collaborator, that's plagiarism. Other than me. Remember that. Okay? All right. So uh, we want to talk about uh, derived classes. So what I have over here uh, is, uh, um, so for the first time you will see that a solution has more than one project in it, okay? So um, the reason that I have several projects is that each project builds upon the other one when I'm teaching what, uh, what was there over there? No, you wanna sit some, or are you, do you see everything? Are you, okay. <laughs> Okay, so, yeah, so the first one is that July 11th thingy that is today, and I have the program in here. So as you see, that's the program, the arrive classes, and I can set it as startup project, which means when I do control F5, that is the project that gets executed. So when I do something like this, it's gonna actually run it, and three years later, it's gonna print the arrive classes, right? So that's how it works. If I want the second one to be uh, uh, to be the startup project, I can set that one to be the startup project. If I compile it now, the second one is going to go through. So uh, to teach derived classes, I, I create an imaginary class and I call it an animal. What is my uh, abstraction of an animal? What does that mean, abstraction of an animal? Yes, what is my view of an animal, okay? So I do, and it's absolute BS. So when I look at it, you look at it, it doesn't make sense, but it's just, I'm just trying to give you an example of, for, for derived classes and stuff like that, so I start with an animal. So to me, an animal, <coughs> so I create, and as you see, it's a modular one. Oh, by the way, I have my class utils over there that has some few stuff that I have done in different things, and, and I didn't clean it up, so it has lots of stuff, bells and whistles, that I'm not using it. It's just the utils thing. And if you look at my utils over here, uh, you'll see it's actually a class called utils, and I have all this stuff that I have as members, okay, member functions of the class. So to lower 
lowercase as a character if I want to do so. Um, SDR cat does string cat concatenation. Uh, string compare, two different ones. I have string compare that string compares from one to another and a string compare that does with the thing, string copy the same. And there is something you need to know about how to commenting every single function that you have. So when you create a function to explain how the function works, the standard way of doing it is to put three slashes and it brings it up, something like this. It's at the top, you mentioned the summary, whatever the summary of the thing is. So in here, for example, this string compare, and I'm gonna say compares to strings, compares to C style, style uh, strings, null terminated character arrays, okay? String to compare, same thing, string to compare. Then I'm gonna say uh, up to, compare up to this, compare up to this many characters, okay? So essentially I'm saying what each element is in here, and then at the end I'm gonna say returns, I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna say less than zero, if S1 is less than S2. And I keep going like that. And I uh, uh, write all the things that it's supposed to say. So it's uh, greater than zero. Greater than zero if S1 greater than zero, and zero if identical. What happens is that adding these things, when you go over it, when you, uh, like when I actually save this thing, and I go over it uh, in another place that I actually look at it, it will actually show all the uh, comments for it in a dialog box so I can see exactly what my function does. So it's a standard way of uh, commenting all your, uh, all your um, functions. So if you have a function and you have a utility thingy and you don't know how it's gonna work later on, you want to actually comment it, comment it like that, and when you're actually using them, it will show you how it works. Like you see over here it says, uh, the parameters are this, returns the address of the destination, plus one over, so it shows every, this one has problem with XML. A uh, name contained invalid character. Probably these are the ones. I think for that, uh, there you go. So for, for that one, you have to put the HTML stuff. That is, uh, I think, ampersand GT semicolon to do greater than an ampersand LT semicolon to do less than because it's an Excel document. So, yeah, let me actually try it. For, for each function, not class at all, functionality of each thing. So, uh, so, let me see if that's the one. So, I think it was LT like that, right? That's less than, correct? There, there we go. So, that's what I had to do. So, this greater than is greater than, but, uh, okay? So now we know, <laughs> okay? So there you go. So that actually shows how you do it. Just put three slashes. I think even Xcode expands it like that. It's a standard XML, explana explana XML definition of a function. Anyways, so that's my utils, and it has its implementation for all the things that I have. If you think something is wrong over there, let me know. That's the implementation of, my implementation of all those good stuff. Okay, so that's the utils. If I use anything in it, I'm gonna use that. Now, um, so forget about it, that's just utils. Oh, and there's one more thing about utils that I have in here. Is it in utils? Yeah, 
Uh, so this utility of mine is a class, correct? Did your uh, previous prof uh, tell you about extern? Did I tell you about extern? OK. So I have a utils class, correct? Now, because it's a class, to be able to use this thing, I need to instantiate the class, correct? Any place that I want to use it. Do we understand? I created a utils class with some utility functions in them. If I want to use it to lower, I have to instantiate utils to be able to use to lower, right? Which is a pain. When utils by itself is a class that is supposed to be used everywhere for its utility purposes, like cout that is an instance of OStream, I don't need to have five different versions of it. Just one thing should get generated and created automatically for me. So what I do in my utils.cpp, right at the top, as you see, I am instantiating utils, a global variable, as what we call it in C, right? I'm creating an instance of utils, and I'm calling it ut. Are we OK with that? OK? The only problem is that that ut, although it's a global variable, but what is its scope? What is the scope of ut? Is it function scope? Is it block scope? Is it global scope? Is it file scope? What is the scope of the ut? When I say scope, what do I mean? Where is it, where is it visible? OK. UT over here, where is it visible? No. Oh, no, no, no. It's global for a rookie programmer. But for us, it is file scope. A global is not global. If you go to another file, you won't be able to see it, right? The only file that ut is visible is utils.cpp, correct? And what's the use of it? <laughs> I, want this to, I want to use that ut thingy everywhere. So how do I make that ut visible everywhere? Now, a question. Pardon me? But how? Functions, you know, if I write a global function, a helper function, and I want a helper function to be available everywhere, what do I add? in my program, that's IPC. It's not a tricky question, it's just awkward question. Let me ask you. So I write a function that I love it, and I want to use it everywhere. What do I do for that function to be visible everywhere? You know the answer. If I, everybody knows the answer. If I told you, go to, ah, oh, that was a question. How do you make it visible to everywhere? Thank you. And I put the prototype of the function inside the header file, correct? Only if I could create a prototype for a variable. I know how to create a prototype for a function, right? You, you write, just write the name of the function and its parameters and everything. You put a semicolon at the end. You put it in a header file. At any place you include the header file, the function is inaccessible, correct? I can do the same thing with a variable. That is called extern. So I'll go to utils.h, and right down here I say extern utils ut. You know what does it mean? I am telling to anybody who is including utils.h that there is an external variable of type utils created somewhere called ut. Use it. So it becomes a prototype for the global variable. C out is exactly like that. Somewhere in IO stream header file, there is an extern O stream C out semicolon. So at any place you include IO stream, you can use the object C out. How? Was that magic? No, that's extern. Got it? So by doing this, that utils of mine becomes available everywhere, and I can use it. So that was the example that I had over there, so no, you know. So. Uh, Let's cut the long story short and uh, uh, talk about the animal. So say I have an animal, and my animal has a name. That's the encapsulation of my animal. So an animal for me is a thing that has a name, OK? It can act, it can move, it can make a sound. 
So if I have a, uh, I don't know, I can have a, uh, let's say if my animal is a dog, I'm going to call it Woofy. And the act is that's being playful, move is running around, and sound is making, saying woof. Okay? So that's my abstraction of an animal. The copy constructor and copy assignment that you see up there, they're just there, for example, if you want to, because you, were, you just came out of classes with resources, you want to see when constructors and stuff are called. That's, uh, uh, I created over there with messages in it. It's not necessary because I don't have any resources outside of the class. So that copy construct and assignment operator is irrelevant to our story. I have two uh, uh, methods in here. One is an accessor and the other one is a getter. Okay? Name is the accessor that ac accesses the name of the animal safely. And again, name over here is a setter that sets the name of the animal if I need to. Are we okay with this? Everybody's okay with this? And I have a destructor for no apparent reason, just because I want to know when a destructor is called. So this is how you write a sample program to test things, okay? Now, I don't want all these messages that I want to, because in, in my animal constructor, I have things like animal got created, animal got destroyed, animal got copied. I have stuff like that so I can trace and see how things work. I don't want those things to always be vis <laughs> visible. So I create a Boolean debug variable in my animal, and I make it extern. And I always put an if statement beside my debug. If my debug is true, I'll show the messages. If it's false, I don't. So I can actually turn all the messages on and off so it, doesn't become, it, it won't become uh, um, uh, bothersome. But what we are interested in is that I have an animal. Animal has a name. It can act, move, and make a sound. And if I look at the animal implementation, as you see, I, it's exactly like the other one. So I create the debug variable as a file scope variable in my animal. And I set it to false. But if you want, you can set it to true to activate all the messages. So what does the animal do over here? Uh, it gets the name and sets the name. And it says, if debug is on, see out creating uh, name the animal, whatever the animal. OK? That debug is a variable. It's a global variable. And I make it available to everyone by making it an extern. Yes? No, no. When I said over here, when I say extern over here, I'm not redefining. I'm just affirming it. This, is, this works like a prototype for a file scope variable to make it global. So because I had Boolean debug over there, I want to introduce debug to all my files. Say, hey, there is a variable called debug. Use it. If you activate it, you can see the messages. If you don't, you don't. So this just becomes a global variable. But again, yes? Let me split it so we can see. Why did I add what? What did, I, what did I say this is? Repeat what did I say. I said this is, what does it do? It's a, proto it's a prototype to make the debug visible to everyone. Correct? What is, what is it that I want to make global? It's line seven, correct? It's a Boolean debug, right? If I don't mention what is the type, how do you know what is it that is global? Yeah, that's the header file. That's why I have it here. She's saying, why well, you're writing Boolean here and there? That's your question, right? Because I'm introducing it. If I don't, then how, how do I introduce it? What is the meaning of introducing something? To give its name, to give its type, right? That's how I introduce it. And that's exactly what I'm doing over here, right? I am sorry that I have to take calls because uh, I, well, let me just pause this. Let's make it clear one more time. Let's make it clear one more time. 
the extern, the extern introduces a variable to make it global to everywhere. Okay? The syntax for it says when you might when you want to make something global, you copy all the information that the variable has and you put it in front of extern. Okay? So if I want, if I have a variable, if I say, for example, I have over here double pi, I have over here const, double pi is set to uh, three point. So that's the pi, right? Now, if I want to make that constant available everywhere, what I need to do is to get all its identifying features and put it in front of an extern. It's not that why you are writing it again. It's that you must write it again so everybody can see. Because header file is visible everywhere, your file is not. Am I making sense? What was your question? Everything that's, that includes header file. It has a namespace of a different ball game, which you, you know. So you mean that everywhere? Where is this extern uh, identified? In header file, inside what? SDDS namespace. So header file has to be included, and SDDS must be used. So that's of course. Because it's it is an it is in a, because it's a namespace. So I put it in a space of the names. No. Are you including CPP anywhere? I think we have to go back to the concept of header files. What header files are for? So you put the extern in CPP file, what does it accomplish? You have to put the extern somewhere everybody can see, right? And that's the header file. All right? Okay. All right. So I'm removing that pi because we don't need it. Anyways, now forget about those old bells, bells and whistles and let's pay attention to what we need to talk about over here. So I have an animal. Animal has a constructor. I can set its name. And forget about the, 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 construct, the copy constructor and, and uh, copy assignment. We don't care about those. I can set the name of the animal. I can get the name of the animal. Animal acts like an animal, moves like an animal, sounds like an animal, and animal gets removed at the end. So when I actually write a code for this, this is my code. I create animal A. I'm going to say equal to Buffy. So the name of my animal is Buffy. And I say A act, B act, sorry, A act, A move, A sound, and I finish the program. Because debugging is false over there, I'm not, I'm not going to see any messages. It's just going to show me that. Act like an animal, move like an animal, sound like an animal. That's it. Nothing else. If I want to see how it actually works, uh, how everything is getting created, I'm going to set this thing to true. And because now it's true, it actually shows all the messages that are inside the constructor. So it says creating Buffy the animal and act yada, yada, yada. And at the end, it says removing Buffy the animal. So the first one is the constructor being called. The last one is the destructor being called. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with what our animal is doing? Now, of course, I, I added that copy constructor and copy assignment. So at home, if you wanted to test and see how copy constructor and copy assignment and everything works, you can actually uncheck these. And as you see, I have a show animal over here. And show animal is something that is receiving by reference. Therefore, no copy is happening. If you remove the reference over here, a copy constructor will be called over this. So now if I run it, you're going to see a mess happening. 50,000 things happen. So, so what happened over here is this. It creates Buffy the animal. Then it creates a nameless animal. Then it's setting uh, uh, nameless to Buffy, which is 
B being set to A, that's the assignment operator, correct? Then it shows A, 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 which is move like yada, yada, yada. Then it passes A by value. Therefore, X becomes a copy of that one. That's copying Buffy the animal. Here is happening. And then it says showing Buffy. And after Buffy is shown, X is returned. Because X is returned by reference, no copying is made. And it re removes the X. Then it says removing Buffy the animal, removing the animal. So those are the two things. If I remove this one too, it's going to be even worse. Which means, although I'm not even receiving anything in here, but because an animal is returned by value, another copy constructor is called. So if I run it, it goes banana like this. Okay? Walk through it and see how it works. This is for your thing at home to uh, review what you have done uh, um, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, classes with resources. So I'm going to do it like this and comment it. Now if I make these actually say const animal reference, and in here, const animal reference x. If I actually do that, you will see that none of those copying stuff happens and it becomes much shorter, as you see. So do those things and try it at home and see how the copy constructor and copy assignment works just for practice. Again, this was just uh, kind of get your brains going, OK? So we are good now. Now let's start. So I have an animal. My animal has a name, and it can act, move, and make a sound. OK? That's what I do. Now, now that I have an animal, I want to have a cat. Now that I have an animal, I want to have a cat. So how do I go about it? Do I create a cat that is an animal and add all the features of an animal inside the cat? or I reuse the definition of animal and just add the features that a cat has. Now, comparing a cat to an animal, what cat has that an animal does not? No, it has something that animals don't have. Huh? Nine lives. It has number of lives, right? <laughs> a cat has number of lives that uh, an animal doesn't have, so I need to add that feature. Not every animal, not every animal has number of lives. Okay? And depending how many times you kill the cat, <laughs> that number reduces until it gets zero, and that's the time that it's dead, right? I'm so sorry. It's a cruel type of a, an example, but something that everybody knows. All right? So if I actually want to do that, now the, the, the cat one over here is much cleaner. I removed all those extra stuff that I added for practice. Uh, so this one is a cleaner one. So when I actually look at the cat, this is the syntax, ladies and gentlemen. So this is our animal thingy that is uh, clean. You see that protected over there? Ignore it for now. I'll explain what it is. We only knew private and public, right? And that's one thing that is called protected. I'll talk about it soon in a second. Protected is somewhat public. <laughs> Let's put it like that. Mildly public, OK? I'll explain what it is. But anyways. <coughs> So I have the class animal, <coughs> and I have all the good stuff that animal has, act, move, la da da destruct, and all the good stuff, and I have the debug thingy and everything. But how do I create a cat out of it? To create a, a class out of an already existing class, what you do is this. You write class cat, public animal. What does it mean? A cat is an animal. So now this class cat of mine has everything that an animal can do. As you see in here, I can completely remove all these things, OK? And my cat becomes just an animal that has number of lives. And as you see, it has a constructor. And the constructor has the name that the animal gets. But also, it has number of lives, because that's what cats do, right? So, but if you think some of the things that an animal do, cat does it, but in a different way, 
you modify those. Got it? What I mean is that I would say cat acts exactly like its parent. I don't need to make any modification, or I do need a modification. Let's check. Cat acts a little bit playfully, right? So it's not like a regular animal. So that I will actually change, which means I will add the exact same function that the parent has, which means this will overwrite what the parent did. My father was a teacher, actually. He taught mechanics. I'm a teacher. I teach C++. OK? So to me, to I, like my father, am a teacher. But my teaching method is teaching C++. It's not teaching mechanics. You follow? It's the same thing. So in here, cat is an animal. But the act of can, uh, cat is different. So I implement the identical method as the animal. This type of thing in functions we had, uh, if we had a function with the same and different, same name and different arguments, what do we call it? Overloading, correct? This is called overriding, not overloading. Because this cat completely, this function completely shadows the parent's act. Which means if you create a cat and say act, the act of parent will not happen. The act of the child would happen. Okay? But I don't have a move, which means a cat moves like its ancestor, like its, uh, like its parent. Therefore, I, did no, I don't need to implement anything. I'm just going to leave it like that. A cat makes a sound. It's a meow, right? So I have to change it. So I'm going to add that one. And cat has an additional method that an animal doesn't have that is playing. So as you see, I can actually get the information that I have for an animal and just modify it. So let's come over here. Let's say I'm going to remove the act. I'm going to remove the sound, and I'm just going to add a place. So if I come to cat.cpp, I'm going to let me, I'm just going to put it over here like that. All right. So, and this one too. So I'm going to remove the act, comment it, and I'm going to remove the sound, comment it. OK? So now take a look. The cat of mine over here, as you see, only implements a new thing that is play, and everything else is exactly how, how it was before. If I do something like this and run it, I didn't do much, which means because my cat over here implements nothing other than just adding number of lives, correct? So nothing extra is done to the animal. It's kind of a useless type of inheritance. You usually inherit something to make something new out of it, right? If you just change it, you just change its name. So we, we don't like that. We want to do, do some modification. That's why I, I add those things. So I'm going to go with that act again and uh, <coughs> uh, mm, uncomment the act again. So uh, let's just uh, take a look at it as it is now. Uh, let me see if it's going to actually, oh, and also another thing that I wanted to mention before we continue, if your dad has a car, okay, probably he lets you drive it, right? Or if your wife has a car, probably she lets you drive it, correct? All right, but it doesn't give the car to the neighbor. That's protected. OK? So when something is private, it's private. My dad has a Porsche 911, doesn't let anybody touch even his children. That's private. He has that Ford Festiva, 20-year-old <laughs> Ford Festiva, that is protected, which means lends it to all family, children, everybody. Right? And it gives right to people, and that's public. OK? So that's what it is. If you want a property of the parent to be completely 
inaccessible to the child and child cannot access it, we make it private, which is the name and the function name that sets the name. So let's say we are designing the animal in a way that nobody can change the name. The name must be changed and set by animal itself and no one else. Okay? But if we want to see what is the name, the child needs to know. So I give access only to child to extract the name and no one else. So no one else outside of the territory of the, the animal can, can extract the name manually. If they want to, they have to go through its functions. But the child, the derived class of the animal can do so. That's why it becomes protected. So if you add a protected method, it means it's accessible to derived classes, but not to outsiders. Yes? <clears throat> Protected is transitive, goes all the way through. <clears throat> protected is transitive. <clears throat> you can change that settings, but it's too rich for our blood. Okay? You can make it to only be accessible to the child, but not the grandchild. We are not going there. Okay? It's too rich for our blood at the moment. OP345, hopefully. Okay? Not even there, I believe. So these are like, uh, there are some stuff that are a little too. Complicated, we don't talk about it, okay? And public is public, which means <clears throat> even outsiders, anybody who has the, uh, an object of, of, of animal of any type, they can use it. So if I come back over here <coughs> to this cat of mine, and let's just take a look at it. So I'm going to uh, bring back the act and bring back the sound and go to CPP, bring back the act. and break back the sound, and we're going to walk through it to see how it works. So uh, let's just uh, start and see how it works. All right. Put it over here, and this one over here. <coughs> Okay, so we start, we are setting drop debugging to true, just be able to see things. <clears throat> so when the constructor of cat is called, you have many different options. <clears throat> In a constructor of cat, you can invoke the constructor of the parent through uh, the place that I call the initialization area. <clears throat> That's initialization area that I name it that, the area for initialization is not in any textbook or anything. I just name it that so I can refer to it. So we'll go through it. So when I say create a cat with two arguments, what happens is it goes to the constructor of the cat with two things. And as you see, you put a, a column over here and then a space between the column and the uh, body of the constructor, and that's the place we call initialization area. Let's. Uh, maximize this. So this area, I call it initialization area. This is the place that you can initialize parts of a class. That parts of the class can be member variables that you initialize, or it could be the, the, the class it's built up of. So I'm saying when a cat is getting created, pass the name to the constructor of its parent, which means let the animal set its name because it has the tools for it, but set the number of lives to the lives that I've received over here. What are these curly brackets over here? The universal way of initialization. I could have used braces. Doesn't make any difference. It's the same. You can, like this one, I could, I, this one could have, I just put two different ones for you to see. It could be like this. This is perfectly okay. All right, or it could be like this. This is perfectly okay too. Are we okay with this? All right. <coughs> so <coughs> essentially what I'm saying is that I'm telling 
to set your animal sight. So what happens is that it goes up and sets its animal sight. So where it first it goes to animal, gets the name that was, what was the name? The name was, oh, it initializes the name to zero first. So it sets the name to Fluffy. So <laughs> it sets the animal to Fluffy, and it's going to say creating Fluffy the animal. OK? And let me just, um, at some place, I have set up for the lines to wrap, and I don't know how to unwrap it now. I'll find it later on. Anyway, so yeah, so now, as you see, it says, creating Fluffy the animal. That's the constructor of the parents getting called. Now that the parent is set up, it sets the number of lives to five. It's been killed four times already. And then in here we are saying if the bug is on, then it's going to say uh, creating Fluffy the animal. The, the first line is printed by the constructor of the parent. And the second line is created by the constructor as a, as a cat. Let me say as a cat with five lives. Are we OK with this? OK? That's how derived classes are created. You can set up everything about the parent inside the constructor, any parts that you want, and you go about it. But again, a child, a derived class, is limited by the capabilities of its parents, which means because the name that we had over there, uh, the getter name function, was uh, protected which means the cat can use, cat can print its name if it wants to. But cat, cat cannot rename itself because then the getter, the setter name function of the animal was private. So it's limited to the, the capabilities of its parent. <clears throat> so now that the animal is created, I'll come over here. Now I'm going to create a default cat. In default cat, I create a default constructor for cat. And I'm going to say, if I don't mention what's the name, the name is Garfield. OK? Those people who are old know what Garfield is. Yes? It's not useless. They are being called behind the scene. They are being used by the parents still. When you are setting a name, parent is using to set it. They are indirectly being used. Let's put it that way. So if the name class that, ex that uh, sets the name is used in the parent class, you are still using it in a child class when you are, call when you are invoking the constructor, because that's where it's used. So all those private methods are like engine of the parent class that help you do things. You are using it indirectly, but directly you cannot use it. So if you say useless, I would say no, it's very useful, but it's behind the scene. It's as if you say, OK, a vehicle has an engine. Now I'm creating a BMW. Is the engine useless? No, engine is a private thing. You don't have access to it. You have to use the accelerator to increase it. So you don't touch that engine. But when you create a BMW out of vehicle, the engine is still useful. It makes the car move, but you don't have access to it because it was private. Are we good? <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. Beautiful question, actually. Anyways, so, so for the, if you do not mention how to create, so if in the initialization area you do not mention animal Garfield, then it means your parent must have a default constructor. If you don't mention, the rule stays the same. It will call the default constructor. If I do not mention, default constructor is needed. But you can call anything you want. You can build your parent any way you like when you are creating the derived class. So the base class can be created in any shape or format. Maybe when you have a two-argument constructor, you don't want the class to be named certain thing, and you want it to be defaulted, you could just set it to be defaulted. It's your choice. You're free to do anything you want when you are creating the parent. In my case, in here, I'm saying when cat is created, make the animal Garfield, OK? If I didn't mention that, then it would have been nameless, which maybe that should, be, should have been the case, depending on uh, the abstraction we are using.
which means the, uh, our needs. What needs do we have? It depends on the business logic and how it's run. But anyway, so now <clears throat> it uh, goes to the, uh, let me just see how is the animal. So my animal doesn't have a, a default constructor in this case. You see that? Does it? Oh, it does have. It's nameless. nameless. Sorry. Yeah. So um, I'll go over here. And I'm going to run it next time without that one. So we see. So now it's going to create uh, 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 Garfield the animal. And it's going to say, as defaulted cat with nine lives. And I didn't mention lives for some reason. Nine lives. OK, of course, it's not going to run now because I didn't mention it, but I do, I'm doing it right now as a cat with nine lives. Anyways, OK, so and now in here, I'm creating a reference out of C, which means I'm saying cat reference. And so obviously, nothing is created. R is simply a new name for C, and they are identical stuff. Nothing is created. Nothing's going to happen over here. And now I'm going to say G act. It's going to say act playful Garfield cat. Oh, let's go back. <coughs> My apologies. Let's go back. I want to walk through it in detail so we see. So one more time, I'm running it right that, down to that point. OK. Uh, <coughs> yeah, 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 bad boy I am. Lives. And just to show you, if I did not put this one over here, uh, if I did not put this one over here, and ran it, then it would have been defaulted. You see, it's going to say creating nameless animal. So if you do not mention what you have, it will call the default constructor. But we do need it, so I'm going to run it like that. OK, so we are here. So now I'm saying g.act. g was Garfield. So I press F11. It comes to act. It calls the act of the cat and not the parent, as you see. And uh, it says, act playful, go feed the cat. Then comes over here. Now it says C dot act. C was fluffy. So it goes over there. Now it calls the, the act of, the, of C. Now it says C dot move. Because in this abstraction, we said cat moves like any other animal. I did not implement the move. No problem. Because I did not implement it, it goes back to the animal. And it's going to say it's going to move like an animal. Are we good down to this point? OK. And the next thing over here is when it makes a sound. So I'm saying with animal is making a sound, what happens? I'll come over here. I'm going to say it, 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 does, it does make a sound, but it sounds like an animal too. You can always invoke parents' methods inside the methods of the derived class. You just have to put the name of the base class. Instead of a dot, you put a scope resolution. Because it's not an instance anymore, it's part of itself. You are saying, call the sound of my animal part for first. So it actually goes and calls. <clears throat> it says, sound like animal, and says, meow. OK, so as you see, the sound used the parent, the base class's method, and continued as such. OK, obviously, when I come down over here and I say play, that has nothing to do with animal. It's something that is only for a cat, and animal doesn't have that feature. So it's a feature that I added to this one, and it's going to say fluffy cat is playing, and that has nothing to do with the other one. Now, when it actually dies, when things die over here, the, everything dies in reverse order. You know that, right? So first cat is created, then uh, the first C is created, then G, then it goes vice versa. Dying is the exact same way too, OK? Because an animal is, a, a cat is built over an animal. When dying, first it, the animal has to go away, and then and it goes the reverse order, right? When it gets, the one that gets created dies last. So when I do like this, so as you see, first the cat is gone. So first Garfield cat part is gone. Then Garfield animal part is gone. Then fluffy cat is gone. Then and so on and so forth. Are we good? 
Are we good? Are we okay? All right. That's inheritance. That's drive classes. So essentially, and we, do, we, we don't go into more detail than that. Like, for example, in here, just to, I, I don't want you to even think about it, but ju just telling you what possibilities are. So if you see in an, ad an advanced code and you don't understand it, don't worry. It's not your time yet for that. In here, I'm saying cat, public animal. It means inherit publicly the animal, right? And then over there, I have protected yada, yada, yada. You can inherit privately. You can inherit, inherit protectively. Okay? So things like that can happen, although we don't do it. Okay? So we could do stuff like that. Just be aware. But not, I think, even the three, four, five, you do that. Okay? So we only inherit publicly. And then the access modifiers in the parent can be either private, protected, or public. Again, private, it means only the base class has access to it. Protected, it means base class and the derived classes, everything they can access, but outsiders cannot. Public, everybody can access it. Are we good? Are we okay? One? Are we okay? Two? Done. Okay? Problems. What's going to be the problem? Like, it looks like everything is nice and dandy, so what might be the problem? when I actually do this. In the comment section, I built the cat in many different ways. Go uncomment the parts and play with it, OK? So your job is to go home, get this code, and play with it. Do different types of things and modify it, see what happens. Turn the debugging off and on and see all the things that happen, okay? <clears throat> Can't change the solution. What? Oh, I'm debugging? I'm so sorry. The problem is that in an object-oriented world, everything happens literally. What do I mean by that? Whoa. OK. <clears throat> so my name is Fardad, and my last name is Soliman, right? And I just told you that my father taught mechanics. In an object-oriented world, if you say, Fardad, please teach. I'm going to teach C++. But in an object-oriented world, if you tell me, Mr. Soliman, who teach, I'm going to teach mechanics. Which means if you refer to a base, to a derived class as its base, it forgets that it's derived. It acts like its parent only. You can create a cat, but if you point to a cat, because as we mentioned at the top of the thing, cat is an animal, right? Because cat is an animal, a cat can be referred to with the uh, animal's pointer. As you can call me Mr. Soliman, they will use my family name or far that. It's the same thing with uh, classes. A derived class can be referred to or pointed to by a base reference or a pointer. You can have an animal reference holding a reference of a cat. You can have an animal pointer holding the address of a cat. The problem is that if you use the animal reference or pointer and call all the features of the cat, cat will forget that it's cat. Everything that is called will be parents. Let's take a look. <clears throat> so I have the animal, the usual, ah! OK, <laughs> got to remove something from there. <laughs> OK, so I have an animal, and the animal has act, move, and sound, exactly as what we had, OK? And then we have the cat. Cat has, so as, as you see, it's much cleaner over here. We don't have all those bells, bells and whistles. And cat is like that. It has act, move, and sound, and all the good stuff. And uh, let's come over here and take a look. So in my main, and uh, if you look at the implementation of the, of the cat, 
cat is looking for, so everything over here is, uh, is overwritten. It, it's, uh, we, over, we overwrote, overwrote everything, if you can uh, say that. So the cat o act overwrites the, uh, the act overrides the act of the animal, move overrides the act of that, and sound overrides the, the sound, and we have the play and all the good stuff, right? Now, <clears throat> if I come over here in my main, I can actually say, okay, I have cat P that is called pepper, right? Then I have an animal pointer, and I dynamically create a cat in it. Remember you told me that when do we use new without square brackets ever? Was it in this class? That's the case. I am creating a cat dynamically, and I don't even have a cat pointer. I put it in an animal pointer. Don't ask me why. You'll find the circumstances later. And I have an animal reference that is holding. I have an animal reference, animal reference, that is holding the, uh, that, that, that becomes an alias for the cat. So cat has an animal alias, animal reference. And then I create an animal called Simba. Okay, so let's walk through it and see what happens. So, so, Cat is getting created. We know exactly how it gets created. First, it creates the animal. Then it creates a cat with nine lives. We're good with that? All right? Again, a new cat is getting created called Tom. So all the constructor is correct. Tom, the animal, is created. And it's a, as a cat with nine lives again. Are we good with that? But remember, Tom does not have a cat reference at all. It is only referred to as an animal. Are we good with that? Are we okay with that? All right, so now, and then I'm gonna give a new name to Pepper the cat, but as animal, that is AR, which is fine. And I'm gonna create symbol the animal that is only, symbol the symbol, symbol the animal that is uh, only an animal, right? Now let's go one by one. Now I'm in here, I'm gonna say P act. When I say P act, it's Pepper the cat, right? Therefore, it goes over there and acts playfully because it's a cat, right? I'm going to say move. It's going to go move like the pepper, the cat. So move is, uh, is, uh, uh, has an override too. And it makes a sound like pepper the animal and says meow. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Any problem down to this point? Now problem is here. I have an animal reference. We know that animal reference is holding the reference of Pepper the cat, right? When I say AR act, because AR is an animal reference, although it is a reference of a cat, it completely forgets that it's a cat and it's going to act like an animal, not a cat anymore. And the same thing over here. If I say move, it's going to move like animal and sound like an animal. No meow. It even gets worse. The animal pointer that I had actually has a cat in it. But because I created the cat in an animal pointer, I can't even access any part of the cat parts. Ever. Ever again. Because there is no way to go back. I can, I can, <clears throat> you can, you can, uh, uh, what shall we call it? You can say that a cat is an animal. You cannot say an animal is a cat. That's wrong. So you cannot go upwards ever. Because maybe there's, I don't know, a canine? Maybe there's a bird after a animal? You cannot go back. You don't know which one you're going back to. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'll explain. Not at the moment, but it will do. So, so what happens over here is that it comes over here. Now if I do the act, I'm not going to go through the detail. You know because it's an animal pointer, it's not going to do anything with Tom as a cat. <clears throat> and at the end, I'm not going to even do the animal thingy. We know what happens when I do the animal. And problem comes over here. When I am deleting a P, what is it deleting? It is deleting the cat, correct? But compiler only sees an, an animal. 
Therefore, only the animal part gets deallocated and cat remains in memory. And that sucks. That's memory leak. So what happens over here will be actually this. Removing Tom the animal, you see? And cat part is not deleted. It's a leak, as we mentioned over there. And when we go to the end, everything else dies perfectly. Simba dies as an animal because it's an animal, right? And Pepper the cat and Pepper the animal, they actually all are both dead properly. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Are we okay? That's the problem that we face. Five minutes break. Okay. It's the most boring thing I know, but because I see people going. No, 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 wait. <clears throat> After these messages. <laughs> oh, I, I got to pause. Please remind me to resume when I'm, when I'm continuing. <coughs> so we found out that we, when we actually create, when we actually point, or refer to a child with its parents' reference or pointer. In other words, when we refer to or point to a derived class using the base class's reference or pointer. Now, it could be any base. I can have a base class and a derived and a derived two and a derived three and a derived four. They all can still be referred as base. It's like a, if the base class is inherited three times, and it has a grand-grandchild over there, OK? It's the same thing. You can still refer to them as base, OK? If that's the case, how do I tell to the compiler, hey, compiler, when I'm using this pointer of the base class, please look and see, when I'm calling this function, look and see if there is a more recent version of it. What is a more recent version? For example, when I had the cat, and cat had act, it didn't have move and had sound, right? When I create a, an animal, a, a cat, and I point to it as an animal, and I, and I say act, because act of an animal has a recent version in cat, the act of cat should be called, correct? But when I actually say move, in the cat, I did not specify what move is. Because I did not, there is no recent version. Therefore, the animal will be able to call it. There is a way to do that. And it's a very simple thing. The implementation you see over here is exactly like what we had before. So when you actually <clears throat> look at uh, the cat, uh, the cat has moved to, I'm just going to remove the move just to show you the possibilities over here. So I'm going to comment this one, too. Um, OK. So in here, if I come over here and set the functions one by one as virtual. So I'm going to set everything as virtual. When you say virtual, you are telling to the compiler, when you are calling this using an animal pointer, see if there is a recent one. See if there is a newer one. Call that one instead. So that problem with when you call something by its base, it acts like a base, will go away. So this is kind of an arrow forward. It tells the compiler, check to see if there's a new version of cat, and call that one. So it is identical to what we had before. So when I run this program, as you see, <clears throat> it 
it creates a rat, pepper, fluffy, that is in a pointer of a cat, and an animal pointer that holds the, the tom, the cat, and everything, and uh, it has the reference to. So A is an animal, so A is an animal, so because there is, it, because it's an instance of animal, it doesn't matter if act is virtual. There is no cat. So virtuality, when you have a, a class pointed with a pointer or reference of the same class, doesn't do anything. It's just as if it's not there. Virtuality only comes in play when you have a child referred to or pointed to as a parent. Other than that, virtuality doesn't mean anything. Do we understand this? So virtuality only comes to play when inheritance is involved. When there is no inheritance, who cares if it's virtual? Virtual essentially says, if the child exists, do the child action if, it, if it's there. Right? Now, <clears throat> we're going to come to this one. Pepper the cat. I don't care. Again, here, virtuality doesn't mean anything. I have a cat, and the reference is cat. Everything is cat. Everything is going to work like a cat. I do not care. Right? And the other one, uh, uh, the second one that says move pepper animal, because I removed the move. Cat doesn't have a move in here. That's why it acted like an animal. Now we're going to come to the other one. Now I have cat the pointer and fluffy. Again, virtuality doesn't mean anything. Because I have a cat pointer pointing to a cat. They're both cats. No virtuality. I run it. Nothing happens. It works exactly the same. Right? Now, I'm going to use an animal reference which holds the reference of Pepper the cat and call the act. When I come over here and I say, hey, animal reference, act, because act is virtual, it sees to see if there is a latest version. It says, OK. I am a reference of animal, but am I referring to a cat? Yes, I am. Is the cat, is the action over here virtual? Yes, it is. See if cat has an act, call that one instead. Therefore, the latest version of act will be called, and it's going to be the cat. Move, although it's virtual. But I did not implement it in the cat. So virtuality doesn't do anything. Sound is virtual. Therefore, the latest method is called. And the same thing over here for the pointer. The exact same thing. Pointer is an animal pointer. It is, but cat is Tom. It's a Tom the cat, right? When I run it, everything works perfectly because the latest versions are called. Are we OK with this? When I delete C, Virtuality do not, does not come to play. Why? Because I have a cat. Pointer is cat. I am removing a cat with a cat pointer. Everything's beautiful. Nothing's over there for me important to go through. Everything works perfectly. But when I delete the animal pointer, because I made the destructor virtual, it says, call the latest one. So what happens? When the, when the destructor wants to get called, it calls the latest destructor. Which one is the latest one? Cat. So it kills the cat. And when the cat is removed, automatically animal is removed too. So now if I do something like this and, and execute this, you will see that, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so Tom is, Tom is removed too and no memory leak is done. Uh, and same thing over here. So in here I have, I'm saying tickle A and tickle P. So I am passing the animal to an animal function by reference. No problem. It's an animal. So what happens, it's going to make it sound, sound, sound like rat the animal. No problem. But if I come over here <clears throat> and tickle P that is a cat and I pass it 
as a reference of animal, now through function call, virtuality is activated. I am pointing, I am referring to a cat like an animal. So the tickle over here automatically makes the sound of the animal like the cat. So meow is going to happen over there. Got it? And that is why when you overload uh, C out, the insertion operator or ex extraction operator with O stream, and you pass a file to it, automatically it writes like a file because the writing is virtual in O stream, which means the latest version will be called, which means if you pass a file to it, it will write like a file, not like the console. That's how the magic happens, true virtuality. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? So that's that one, and that's virtuality. So from now on, till the moment you die, you never create a destructor that is not virtual, even if you don't plan to have inheritance. All destructors must be virtual. Why? Because one day, if you do inheritance and use this class as a base, that virtual guarantees that you're not going to have memory leak in dynamic memory allocation. All destructors from now to the end of your career in C++ must be virtual. It should, you should think that the syntax of a destructor is virtual till the yada, yada, yada. Always have the virtual at the beginning to make sure that you don't have a memory leak. And going back to what I wanted to say over here, if I, <clears throat> uh, now I'm going to bring the move back. So cat's going to have the move, but in animal, I'm not going to make the move virtual, which means when I'm designing my animal, I'm going to say when, if anybody uses this animal as a base class, I want act to be improvable, updatable. I want sound to be updatable. Destructor is a must. There is no question about it but I do not want the move of the animal to be modified in any way. I want, if anybody calls me an animal, I want to move like an animal. If you want any action not to be updatable, you don't make it virtual. Is that clear? Virtual, so if I, some, if, this, is, this is an interview question. What does virtuality do? This is the textbook answer. It guarantees the execution of the latest version of the method in the hierarchy of inheritance. Or, in short, what does virtuality do? Calls the latest version of the method. Done. What virtuality does? Calls the latest version of the method, no matter what. So if you want something to be updatable, you make it virtual. Now if I make the move like this, and I run the program again, and I call the program again, Sir, is your father. What's up? Constructor? Constructor doesn't make sense. You're constructing something. How can you construct? You say, I want to create an animal, but make it a cat. No, you can't do that, <laughs> right? When you want to make a cat, you make a cat. Constructed, they don't make sense to be virtual or not. That's why they can't. When you are building something, when I'm building a BMW, I want a BMW. I'm not, I'm not going to say, make me a car, but don't tell it to anyone, make it BMW. That doesn't make sense. That's why constructors' virtuality don't make sense. Yes? So, so let's say mammal is a Dirac class of animal. Cat is a Dirac class of animal. Then we don't need to write virtual for mammal. So it's the other way. You're saying, let's say, what, what, what mammal is, is the base base class, and then... 
Oh, you're saying you're saying uh, we have more hierarchy going down. Uh huh. Okay, amazing question. Virtual is transitive, which means if, if I had a cat and I inherit a lion out of the cat, okay, then the sound of the cat will be virtual even if I don't write it. It's the higher hierarchy that dictates what, what, function, what uh, method is virtual or not, which means... In this cat, I'm not saying virtual act, correct? But because animal has a virtual act, it means if something inherits out of cat, let's say I have a lion out of cat, and lion has an act, and you refer to lion as a cat, and you say act, the act of lion will be called. So virtuality is transitive. That's why it's good practice to write virtual anyway, so if somebody is inheriting something from cat, they're not going to be caught by surprise. Got it? All right. I'm going to, this thing's going to become an animal kingdom. I'm going to make it like, it's going to be a huge thing with birds and dogs and everything woofing around. So you'll see all those things happening. Yes. Can we also introduce virtuality? So it now move is not virtual. So you can make the next, from now on it becomes virtual. Yes, of course. I can, I can actually go to cat say, from now on, I'll make move virtual, which means if you use an animal pointer, no update. But if you use it, so if I have a lion, and I say, and I refer to lion as an animal, and I say move, lion's going to move like an animal. But if I make the move of the cat virtual, and I hold the pointer, hold the animal in a cat pointer, then move will be virtual. You can start virtual halfway through, no problem. Anything before is not. And after is. Are we okay down to this point? Yes. Yeah, to make sure everything is deleted. So you mean do it halfway through? You shouldn't. The structure should be all virtual. If you don't make a destructor virtual, it means you made a boo-boo. So uh, that's the problem. You're right. If, if, let's say, the destructor of animal is not virtual, and I make the destructor of cat virtual, then the lion will, be, will not have a memory leak if it's pointed by cat, but will have a memory leak if it's pointed like with an animal, which means we have a bug in our program. Virtuals. Virtual is always attached to a uh, destructor. Always, always, always. You should assume that that's within the syntax. Are we OK? Now. <clears throat> no, 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 it cannot be. Or maybe there is, and I don't know, but I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Yes. Can you call me Mr. Solimandu? Can you call me Mr. Solimandu? Yes, but it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work or it does work. It works. It's my family name. How does it work? Because it's my family name. A cat is an animal. It will have, because they are virtual. That's the, that's the whole hoopla about virtual. You make it virtual, so it doesn't matter how you call it, the latest version is called. See, the tickle, receives a reference. So A becomes a new name for a cat. If I did not put it a reference and it was an object, then you're right, I was in trouble. Because a cat would have been copied on an animal, which means only the animal part would have been copied, and therefore no update would happen. But I always say, virtuality comes in play only when you have a parent's pointer or reference pointing or referring to a child. 
reference or pointer. That's the reference, which means we are good. Anything that is virtual will be updated. The latest version is guaranteed to be called. That's by definition. Are we okay down to this point? Now the next thing. Do we agree that humans can talk? Right? If I ask you to implement, so I have class human, and I say instantiate a human, and I say implement talking, can you do that? How do you know what's the language? Is it Turkish? Is it Mandarin? Is it, I don't know, English? Talking requires more. Obviously, humans can talk. We know that for a fact. But how? It remains to be decided in further inheritance. Is that correct? So I can have a human. If I have a Cantonese-speaking Chinese person, then I can actually implement the talk for it to be Cantonese. Right? If I make the human inherited into a Turkish person, then it's going to speak Turkish. If it's going to be whatever. So I need to further the inheritance. These type of functions that we are sure they exist, but we don't know still how we can still implement them, or rather enforce their implementation. When I create a class human, I put all the definition of a human, having a heart, having a stomach, having hands, eyes, everything that a human can have. And I put it in a thing, and I put all the definitions. So when I tell you what a human is, you close your eyes. Can you picture it? No, you can't. It's a girl or a boy, or whatever. You can't. It's like, it's like how, how the eyes are going to look like. You can't say. Yeah, you need further exp So these type of classes <clears throat> that, by definition, they are complete, OK? By definition, they are complete. It means they exist in real world. You know what they are. When I say a car, you know what it is. Can you picture a car? Yes, I can. You put all the things. But if I tell you to draw it, you're going to say, which one? It needs to go further ahead. <clears throat> <clears throat> That's implemented using virtuals, but a special type of virtual functions. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry about that. So let's say I have an animal. I know an animal can make a sound. Obviously, they can. But I don't know still how, right? You create a virtual function for sound, and you put this beautiful thing in front of it. What is this? Equals to zero. You know what does that mean? To be implemented later. Which means animal is now becomes something unreal. It's a good design. I know an animal exists. I know it has all the things that animal can do. I know an animal can make a sound. But I cannot create an animal until a cat is created. So I can say the sound of an animal is meow. So to enforce design, you can create, you can start designing your application, your, your class, and, and start implementing whatever you want. But sometimes you get to actions that you know they should be there, but I still don't know how. You make them what we call pure virtual methods. A pure virtual method says there should be a method here with that specification. I don't know how yet. Okay, These type of classes are called abstract base classes. The base classes are ideas only. They cannot exist. I cannot instantiate this animal. If I want to, compiler is going to tell me, hey, you are trying to make something that has an incomplete function in it. 
How do I make a sound when you create an animal? You can't. An animal can only get created if it's a cat or it's a dog. So what I will do, <clears throat> it works the exact same way. So everything is virtual, but this is enforced. So when I actually create a cat, I actually implement the sound. When I create a dog, I actually implement the sound. And the difference is that when I actually create a cat, the cat's going to say meow, and the dog's going to say woof, woof. So when I go in my main, everything is exactly the same. So as you see over here, I'm in my main. I have a dog D, right? Dog D is uh, a dog that I created. Uh, it, it's exactly like a cat, but it makes a sound like wolf, right? <laughs> so, so I create a dog D. I create an array of four pointers of animal. And I put a cat, a dog, and another cat, and the address of that dog that I had over there. Then I put my animal pointer in a loop. And I call the non-existing function of the animal. The animal doesn't have a sound function but it enforces it. So it says an animal must make a sound, but only, only if it's inherited and implemented. Therefore, I call the pure virtual function, and each animal automatically will make the sound that they are supposed to. So when the program is running, I'm not going to go to implementation. It's obvious what it is. Oh, what did I do? What did I do? Oh, stop, stop, stop. I forgot to set the thing to the new one. <clears throat> Add. Uh, set a start a project. So when it's running, the dog is created, creating Milo the dog. If anybody knows who's 1010 and Milo, that's Milo. Anyways, uh, it was created, and now it creates three things. So it creates uh, Jack the animal, then it creates Snowy and Jill. So all these things are created. <clears throat> the fourth one is just an address of something that I had before. Okay. Now, that reference, you know, it's just a reference to show. I just wanted to show that the reference works too. And now when I come over here, all right, now I'm going to say animal number zero, make a sound. That's a cat. It's going to say meow. Then I'm going to say animal number one, make a sound. It's a dog. It's going to say woof, woof. Again, and as you see, the proper action of every single object is called based on their type. What you see in your application is PI sound. Do you see any difference in any type of thing? Like, is the signature different? Is no. It selects which version of sound is called based on virtuality. This is ultimate polymorphism. This is, this is when I talk and I sound like this and my daughter talks and she sounds like that. Automatically we use our own voice. So our talking is virtual and we are both humans. So human talk, automatically the version and whatever it is, gender, type, tone of voice, everything is used automatically by definition as it goes through. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't delete it. I, it did. I deleted it. <laughs> it's dynamic. Good call. It's dynamic. If it wasn't dynamic, it would have been reverse. But because it's dynamic, I kill it anytime I kill it. That's the time it dies. That's the power of the di dynamic memory allocation. So th things don't happen the way. The compiler decides, I decide which one is going to go first. And now at the end, when I'm ending, that's when the dog is going to dog, die, because that's the automatic one. Yes? Did 
to zero, yes. So <clears throat> what we call the, the animal, the previous version of animal that we had, a concrete class. A concrete class is a class that doesn't have a pure virtual method. A concrete class can be created. Every single method is implemented. You know what you want to do. You create it. Later on, you can inherit to do something else. An abstract based class is a class that at least has one pure virtual method. That makes it incomplete. C++ doesn't care if it's one or all. It's all called abstract based classes. Yes. You got it. That's the beauty about it. Because in reality, you can't. In reality, you cannot just build an animal. You have to decide what you want first. You follow what I'm saying? It's like, like you're, when, you're going to make, when you're going to a restaurant, you want to order food, right? When the company says, what do you want? I want food. They can't bring it for you. You have to specify exactly what you want. Food. As an idea, we know exactly what it is. We eat so we are not hungry anymore. But to make food an ex food is an abstract base class. When it's actually made to proper things as they are, and they all make you not hungry, that, those are the concrete classes that satisfy what a new food needs to do. No, you, not let's say. Cannot create, it's abstract. So if you do something like this, the compiler won't compile. Sorry. When you do something like this, the compiler won't compile. It's going to tell you builder, and the error is going to tell you object of abstract class type animal is not allowed. You cannot create an animal. It's not that if I create it, I can't call it. You can't. It's impossible. It's an idea. An idea cannot exist. You must first specify exactly what is it going to do. It's an incomplete design. Are we okay with this? Yeah, that didn't have a pure virtual method. Oh, everything is virtual inside animal. Yes. It's even there's one that happens. Now, no, yeah, then you have to implement that anymore. Then you have to implement the sun. You have to have a function, an empty function, something. Okay. You must implement it. If you make it equal to zero, that abstract this class. Are we okay down to this point? Are we okay? This is two and a half weeks of thing. When you look at it, I have one more thing to tell you to be, to be done with three weeks. I told you that these are also interconnected when I teach it. So we're going to work on, keep working on this in the next two weeks, more experiments, more things. I want you to all go and work with these. Play with them. Make them crash. Uh, you know what I mean? And then come with questions, please. OK? Oh, yes. We're going to go at the desk outside, OK? We're going to find the desk together.